All right, everyone, back we go. We uh, have now Dr. Yoni Friedhoff. Um, I'm just going to read a, a bit of your bio here. Oh, no, do just a bit of your bio just here. Well, I'm going to make stuff up as well. Uh, so Dr. Friedhoff is founder and medical director of the Bariatic Medical Institute in Ottawa and assistant pre professor at the University of uh, Ottawa. This is described here as the uh, nutrition watchdog for Canada, which I think is very apt. And uh, you probably already know his uh, Weighty Matters blog, where he always has some very interesting and controversial things to say. Um, he's also very well known for apparently not sleeping because he's constantly on Twitter and reading the most recent research articles and, and writing a book, as well as a full-time job. Um, not with the aid of Red Bull, though, I'm sure. Um, so he's been a, a fabulous advocate for all kinds of health and children's issues for many years now. And uh, he's going to speak about uh, what we in public health can do, which I think was very apt for this issue and for this audience. Here you go. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for inviting me to come down here. I was a little bit surprised to be invited after the talk that I posted about the food industry a little while ago. Um, I didn't think people would want to invite me to their uh, various events, but it was actually after that that I was invited. So thank you. Um, and so today I want to talk a little bit about where I think public health could put some of its resources. And if I can figure out how to get this going, there we go. Um, I want to start with this. Uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I know you've all heard the adage before. And when it comes to business or sort of this discussion, what I'm getting at is that it's much easier to work with or retain existing customers than it is to try to get new ones. And so in our case, I think the existing customer base are the people in this room, people who care about public health, whose livelihoods are about public health, and whose passions run with public health. Whereas the birds in the bush, well, they may be folks like the food industry, where while they may have a peripheral interest and certainly care about what public health thinks about them, ultimately their job, and this is not a criticism, it's just a fact, their job is to sell their food and their products. And so I think if I were to ask what public health can do, one of the first things I think public health could do, public health could stop inviting the birds in the bush to the table. And so this photograph, as blurry as it may be, was taken in 2005 or 2004, can't remember the year. This was the original launch of the redo of the 1992 food guide. This was a by invitation only gala affair. And at this affair, one third of the representatives there were invited and were from the food industry. And so Health Canada calls the food industry stakeholders. And I agree, indeed, the food industry are stakeholders. What comes from the food guide will absolutely impact upon the sales of industry's products. And while I think they absolutely should be given the opportunity to speak in front of panels and to give their input, I found it very surprising that they were included on all of the levels of the creation of the food guide, including the 12 member advisory panel. On that panel, three people out of 12 were directly representing the food industry. One was the, from the BC Dairy Foundation. BC Dairy Foundation's mandate was increasing milk consumption. On their homepage at the time was a statement that said, don't tell mom, but chocolate milk is good for you. Um, another person there represented oilseed growers. 85,000 oilseed growers at the time were represented by this individual who sat on the advisory board. His excited press release when he was appointed before he sat before he heard and considered evidence and talked about food in Canada, was his mandate being on that panel was to increase the consumption of oils in Canada. And then there was another person on the task force from Food and Consumer Products of Canada who represented you know, a vast array of massive food industry corporations, including folks like Frito-Lay and Coca-Cola. And I guess the question that I ask myself regularly is, do we really want the interests of Frito-Lay represented on the advisory panel for Canada's Food Guide? And so, you know, I think we should stop inviting them to the table. And whether or not 
this had an impact no one will ever be able to prove, but I do know that the food guide explicitly states that chocolate milk is a milk equivalent. I bet this made the person from the BC Dairy Foundation very happy, as did the recommendation that every single Canadian consume two glasses of milk each and every day. That recommendation, by the way, for me, if I followed it, and if I followed the food guide, which I don't, but if I did, would take up the entirety of my dairy recommendations. As a man, the age of 42, I'm supposed to have two servings a day, and that would be those two glasses of milk that I am told to drink each and every single day by the food guide. Now, this, of course, wasn't lost on marketers, and I think that we need to talk not just about marketing to kids, but also about marketing for kids, because parents are a particularly vulnerable population as well. This advertisement came out very much in line. I think it was the day after the release of Canada's Food Guide. Two glasses today because they'll need it tomorrow, it says. And if I blow this up a little bit more, Canada's Food Guide to Healthy Eating recommends kids get at least two servings of chocolate milk every single day. This despite the fact that chocolate milk has double the calories and 20% more sugar than Coca-Cola. You know, this is not a wise recommendation. And yet, we don't make noise about this as public health professionals, as a unified voice. This just keeps going on. And it's not just milk. Here you can see that juice is a fruit equivalent, according to Canada's Food Guide. The Canadian Pediatric Society probably doesn't agree, so they say that fruit is fruit and that juice should be limited to half a cup a day maximum for young children and one cup a day maximum for everybody else. And there's good reason that they make those recommendations. Drop per drop, it has the same amount of calories, the same amount of sugar as Coca-Cola, and in some cases, it has more. And if I took vitamins and I added them to Coca-Cola, it would not make Coca-Cola a beverage we should be recommending people drink on a regular basis, let alone a beverage that was the equivalent of eating a fruit. And yet we do this, and again, this is not lost on marketers. These advertisements came out around the time of the food guide. Two oranges squeezed into every glass. There is good and then there is great. And you can see these little asterisks on both of these advertisements talking about how a glass gives you two full servings of fruit. Well, if you read the small print, it tells you that it's Canada's Food Guide that tells you that. And I especially like the no added sugar ever on the grape juice. Um, adding sugar to grape juice would be quite a feat because per glass there's 10 teaspoons of sugar in every single glass of grape juice. Again, that in that particular case, it is double the amount of sugar that Coca-Cola has dropped per drop. So yes, indeed, I am not surprised that there is no sugar added to grape juice. What about schools? So schools, I think, are an arm of public health. They're publicly funded here in Canada. And yes, we do have an Ontario school food, school food policy, which I'll be talking about briefly. But this doesn't fall under the purvey of the school food policy. These programs exist everywhere. These are programs where you go to a restaurant, so this is no longer being sold in schools. And if you buy pizza, it will help fund some program for the school. We see this constantly. Domino's dough raising night. But it's not just schools. And I think that um, Susie had a slide similar to this one. This is Slices for Smiles. This is a program that runs every year where you can buy pizza to support the foundations of children's hospitals. And this is marketed in the hospitals themselves. This is marketing. And I know we're here talking about marketing to kids and primarily talking about advertising, but this is advertising. And somehow I feel like public health can do better than to support programs that involve selling junk food to help raise money. I appreciate that money is tight and tough to come by. I'm not suggesting any different. And it is a tough message. But ultimately, if we are here talking about marketing junk food to kids, we need to recognize that this is marketing as well. And if we're talking about our own customer base, you would think that our customer base would have some issue with this, that people involved in public health would not want to sell pizzas to raise money for hospital foundations or onion rings for hospital foundations. I wrote the chair of the Sick Kids Foundation about this particular program. And I asked, why are you selling onion rings and, so, and pizzas to raise money? Isn't this anathema to what you really 
want to accomplish in public health? And the answer I got back was, well, it's true, these are not healthy products, but because all of these establishments also sell some healthy products, therefore it's okay. You know, tobacco companies sell a lot of products other than tobacco, and yet I think we would have a difficult time partnering up with tobacco in these types of fundraising events. You know, I, I don't think the means always justify the aims, or the aims justify the means. I might be getting it backwards. Here's Canada's uh, nonprofit Breakfast for Learning, marketing Nutella, and Nutella's breakfast table to kids. And this is really prevalent. This uh, actually was a package I got in my mailbox that came with some samples of Nutella. And they are very aggressive about this marketing campaign, bless you. You know, Nutella, I'm not sure if you know, um, if you compare it with frosted icing, frosted icing is a better choice. Frosted icing has 25% fewer calories and 25% less sugar than Nutella. And here we have a national nonprofit promoting something very important for public health, which is breakfast for kids, suggesting that Nutella is a healthful part of it. I can't think of how you would add chocolate icing to a kid's breakfast and call it a healthy choice. And yet here we're adding a product with more sugar and more calories. And under the banner of a public health program that promotes itself as being healthy, that's exactly what we're doing. This is from one of my local arenas. I'm sure there are people here who are frustrated by their local arenas. This is just one bank of vending machines. There's 18 vending machines in the Walter Baker Center where I took this photograph. I think that we at Public Health could probably be doing more to try to change this sort of a phenomena. I think we will change this sort of phenomena long before we ban advertising to kids. You know, and kids spend an awful lot of time in these arenas. And as a parent, there really aren't any helpful choices to be had. And it's not as if the arenas cannot do something. This very same arena that has all those vending machines also has a policy that asks people not to wear perfume. So perfume's not allowed, but candy, candy's okay. I think we at Public Health need to stop thinking that candy's okay. In terms of school food policies, we have one here in Ontario. It was released with a lot of fanfare. I didn't share in the fanfare as much because on, I think it was a year before the policy was released, Pizza Pizza came out with a press release that excitedly reported that they now have a pizza that meets the mandate of the new Ontario school food policy. And I remember I wrote a blog post that says, you know your school food policy sucks if Pizza Pizza can immediately come out with a pizza that works because regardless of what's in that pizza, teaching children in our schools that fast food pizza is a healthy choice is not in public health's best interest. And yet when the food, when, when that policy came out, there were very few folks making any negative noise about the policy itself. It's a policy that also allows for the sale of baked potato chips. On the right-hand side of that photograph, we've got baked Lay's. On the left-hand side, we have regular Lay's. They're both potato chips. One has, yes, indeed, marginally less in the way of calories and sodium. But now we're selling it to kids in school vending machines, suggesting to them that they are healthy because now we have this school food policy that only allows healthy foods in our vending machines. I don't think we need to do that. Camps. Camps. This is a city-run camp lunch menu. Tuesdays, hot dogs, potato chips, and juice. Wednesday, pizza, cookies, and juice. Thursday, chicken sliders, cookies, and juice. And Friday, fries, freezies, and juice. There has, this is Brampton, by the way. I don't know if anybody is here from Brampton, but, you know, I, I wonder if the Brampton Public Health Department may be able to help pressure this camp because unlike the food industry, I realize, again, the camp's trying to get by and doing the best they can, but, you know, their primary concern is not making a profit off the sale of their lunch items. There's got to be a better way. We have to find a better way. You know, even if it's a difficult thing to do, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. This advertisement or this promotional marketing campaign, this was a photograph taken by a pediatrician here in Toronto, Dan Flanders. This photograph was taken in the North York General Hospital. Um, it also existed in Sick Kids Hospital, the exact same promotion. Buy any two slices of pizza, get a two-for-one movie admission. Thankfully, 
he did take he did have it taken down once he reported this to the folks that the powers that be it was removed but how did it get there in the first place maybe it's because the food in hospitals is horrible this is food in a children's hospital tater tots that look like they might be shaped like letters and pizza and again i appreciate the comfort value of food but truly i think that you know hospital food is an area where there may be a lot of work that could be done by a unified voice from public health saying that we are serving people horrible foods in our hospitals. My father is in a hospital here in Toronto right now. He got his fifth knee replacement. Anyhow, he's been taking photographs of his food for me. I've been putting them on my Twitter stream. It's horrifying. You know, it's truly horrifying. There was one breakfast he got that by my calculation had something in the neighborhood of 14 teaspoons of sugar in it. And this is a man who, whenever he's admitted to hospital, his sugars go above borderline and become diabetic range sugars. And as soon as he gets discharged, they go back down to normal. We at Public Health can do more about this. I'm gonna to return to grape juice. So the Ontario Medical Association shocked a lot of people when it suggested we should have warning labels on grape juice. That consuming grape juice, which again, has double the sugar double the calories of Coca-Cola might be a bad idea. They suggested that we needed to put labels on it to warn people against its consumption. In the United States, CSPI, and I don't know if Bill's here yet. Uh, I don't see Bill, so he'll be here later. But CSPI in the United States actually launched a lawsuit against Welch's for making heart healthy claims on its grape juice, saying that this is not a healthy beverage. And in fact, it may contribute to the development of heart disease through its contribution to things like hyperinsulinemia, type two diabetes. We do have a label here in Canada. It's a health check label. And so, you know, I know that people here are quite familiar with the fact that I'm not fond of health checks, so none of this will be news to anybody, but I really don't think we should be telling people that grape juice is a healthy choice. In the States, we're, they're suing people for telling people that grape juice is a healthy choice. Again, it has a huge number of calories, but it's not just grape juice. If I can get this to move again, it doesn't want to move. I will try this way. Slush puppies can have a health check as well. And then there's these products. So as far as I'm concerned, this is candy. This is candy calling itself fruit. In this particular photograph, we've got fruit twists that do look like Twizzlers, except they actually have less sugar or sorry, more sugar than Twizzlers do, and 10 times the sugar of apples. This one, by weight, it's 79% sugar. 98% of its calories come from sugar, 98%. And we're telling parents, we're marketing to parents from a wonderful organization that this is a healthy choice for children, that this replaces fruit for children, and in the United States, again, CSBI is suing General Mills for making these sorts of statements about their fruit gummies and leathers and so forth. I don't think we should be health checking candy. And we also know that consumers take that check mark to be valuable. That eight in 10 consumers said that they can trust health check because it comes from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And 68% agreed with the statement I can rely on health check to make me help make healthy food choices. This is not a case of here, eat this, it's slightly less awful for you than the one beside it. It's eat this because it's good for you. That is the way people interpret this check mark. And this check mark also tells people to go to restaurants, which I don't agree with. I think that one of the main drivers of diet related disease in society today and obesity is our reliance on convenience, both in and out of the home. We're spending 54% of our food dollar outside the home compared to about 30% in 1970, and the change had already come by 1970. And if we look at what we're bringing into our homes, their convenience products as well, we're basically doing our own restaurant cooking at home. From scratch, fresh whole ingredient cooking is what we need to be promoting. But telling people that they can go to get fast food pizza and again, have it be a helpful choice, not a less awful choice, but a healthy choice, I think doesn't serve public health's interests. Here we give parents permission to not make lunches. 
we have three kids in my family, eight, six and a half, and three and a half. We make their lunches and our own every day. And it does take time and it does take work, but it's not that much time and it's not that much work. But I'm not surprised people don't do it because they've been convinced that they don't have to, that they can buy healthful products or go to restaurants and in fact get that healthy benefit for their child. They can go to Harvey's too. And then going to restaurants is in fact marketed to kids sometimes. This was an advertisement that was delivered to elementary school children who did jump rope for heart for the Heart and Stroke Foundation, telling them to go to have a meal at Boston Pizza. Here's a coupon, take it to your parents. And yet none of the restaurants, if you do want to subscribe to the notion that you can eat healthfully in restaurants, none of the restaurants with the health check program, and uh, you know, Manny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, none of them have health check kids menu items. Um, and you know that's a problem. If you go to Casey's, because Casey's has health checked items. So if you've decided that you can eat healthfully at Casey's, because there are health checked items for you, but you bring your family and you bring your children, they don't have health check choices. If you look at this kid's menu, if you have a kid, and I don't mean this in a mean way or an odd way, but even if you have a kid, you know, odd enough to order the vegetable stir fry off this menu, <laughs> okay? Like, I got three kids. My kids are not ordering the vegetable stir fry, nor would we make them if we took them to this restaurant. But if they ordered the vegetable stir fry off this menu and they had milk with it, um, they would in fact get 783 calories and 735 milligrams of sodium from that meal. And they went there potentially as a consequence of the fact that their parents were trying to eat healthfully because there was a health check item for them over there. Here we're talking about kids. I think marketing unhealthy food, marketing restaurants to Canadians is not in public health's best interest. And, you know, I don't know how this all happened. I don't know where we got all tangled up. I think in part, and I, I'm not trying to be a conspiracist, I do think the food industry is part of the problem. I'm not shy about that. You know, I think it's part of the problem, just like it was with tobacco in the 1940s, 1950s, the goal is to get involved and to be valuable to organizations so that we can't make as forceful a message or we cannot have a unified voice. It's difficult. And, you know, standing here, you might think that I enjoy saying stuff like this. Enjoy is the wrong word. I feel like it's my responsibility to some degree. It's not fun. But criticizing policies and programs that I think are not in public health's best interest, well, I think that's my job partially I, in public health. I think that's all of our jobs. And I think that it's difficult to do that when the food industry is involved, both because we might rely on them for funding and also because it puts a face to things. You know, I, I was told by Brian, I have a little bit of extra time, so I'll, I'll take a couple of seconds extra and tell a story Three years ago, uh, the David Morin, who's the, one of the high-level executives at Coca-Cola, he invited me out for a coffee. He wanted to chat about my criticisms of Coca-Cola. And I went with him. And uh, I bought the coffee because I felt like that would be more appropriate. And uh, we had a lovely discussion. He seemed like a truly lovely man. I'm sure he is a truly lovely man. And there was something that came up in that conversation about their, their open happiness campaign that had lots of cartoons and clearly targeted children. And I asked him about it and he, at least he, he said to me he was surprised by it too. And when I blogged about it the next day, I found it more difficult to be me. <laughs> you know, like it was a horrible program. It's a horrible advertisement. It absolutely targets kids. But now there was a face to Coca-Cola. It wasn't Coca-Cola anymore. It was Dave. And I think that's what happens when we invite the food industry to be at the table as voting members. We put a face to them. It makes it more difficult. They're doing their job. I don't fault the food industry for one moment for the things that they do. They are doing what they can get away with because that is their job. I think we are dropping the ball to some extent. And we need to disentangle ourselves, not just from the industry directly, but from some of the messages they've taught us, like, you know, there is no such thing as a bad food. Of course there's such a thing as a bad food. There's tons of bad foods out there. The goal is to have the smallest amount of them in your lives to like your lives, but they definitely exist. Or this notion that slightly less bad is the same thing as good. Slightly less bad is not good. It's just slightly less awful. 
but we have bought into that as a society that slightly less bad is laudable, that it's a good thing. And I think we need to disengage from that. When I first started the talk, I was gonna call the talk glass houses and I was gonna say, you know, people on glass houses shouldn't cast stones, but I changed my mind as I started writing the talk. And I think that's what public health needs to do. We need to start casting stones. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people in various public health departments and programs and positions where they will tell me off the record and behind a closed door that they think this, that, or the other is insane and that how can we possibly be letting this happen and go on? And they all have lots of reasons why they don't want to speak up. Sometimes it's truly for fear of their jobs. And I get that. I'm not telling people they should risk losing their jobs. But at the same time, I think we need to tear down the house we've built and build a new one, in which case I think casting stones is a good idea. Criticizing programs and policies does not mean we are criticizing people. And there is nothing wrong with saying what we think when we see programs and policies that could be worked differently and better. This is just a small smattering of the stuff that I think public health could absolutely improve, especially with, as Brian says, a unified voice. So I'm sorry if I upset anybody, and thank you for listening.